great. Thanks, Krishna. That was uh, much, much nicer than I deserve, for sure. And so you'll soon find out my kryptonite is uh, public lectures that involve a microphone. But uh, <laughs> so we'll see here. Um, OK, and uh, so I'm really very happy to be here uh, to talk to you guys all about uh, basically just some of the research I've been doing over the last uh, couple of years and some of the things that I've been thinking about. And also, um, in addition, so a little bit about the direction that I think um, certain fields are headed. And so I'm going to talk about culture. And I think what I'm going to talk about, I think uh, many people in economics are coming at these issues, but from different directions. So in political economy, there's increasing research on culture. Behavioral economics is definitely talking about this. Development economics, I think the most exciting stuff in development is, um, is behavioral development economics. And you'll kind of see how these all, all of these things fit together. And of course, economic history, how could I forget? Uh, and you'll see how these all fit together, and I think it, we're really c coming to understand something that's important. So hopefully I can convince you th of that today. So, you know, culture is kind of the key thing that I'm going to talk about. So immediately you're probably thinking, what's he even talking about? Or what is this? What is culture? I hear this thrown around all, all the time. So I'm going to spend actually a fair bit of time uh, precisely uh, defining culture. This is actually going to be with a, just a very, very simple model. And one thing I think it's important to understand is, well, why would culture ever arise? We have lots of models of rational economic man. If you think of culture, well, that's like we're throwing that out the window and people are doing other things. Uh, and so why would one arise in equilibrium uh, rather than the other? If we want to study it, that's something that we really have to think about. And then if we understand culture and think, well, this is well-defined, we can understand it, a natural question is how big are the cultural differences in the world today? If everyone's exactly the same along this cultural dimension, there's no variation, that's a pretty boring thing to study. Okay? Uh, so I'll talk about the differences that we do know. Um, and so even if we have differences, well, if they don't affect anything that we care about, again, that's a boring, unimportant thing to study. Okay, so and I'll provide some evidence, I think, or some uh, motivation that I think culture does affect first order things, right? So I've heard some people recognize, oh, well, yeah, we are beings, that we have these kind of behavioral traits, but that doesn't really affect any important decisions in life. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about whether that's true, that could be true, and we can ignore it, uh, but maybe that's not true. Uh, and then what are the implications for economic policy, right? So if we're actually designing policy, how do we move forward if we have these insights uh, that, that, that we have from studying culture, from understanding it? Okay, so the first question, what is culture? Oh, and just, I'll go for about an hour. And, oh, I should turn my timer on. And I'll leave um, about 25 minutes for, for questions, okay? So if you have, if you have questions, I'm uh, definitely excited to hear them. Uh, so what is culture? Why would it ever arise? So the way I think about culture is you have to start with the first fact is that human beings have cognitive limits. Okay? So we aren't superhuman processors uh, that can process unlimited amounts of information in kind of uh, infinitesimally. So this might seem, okay, that's true. Uh, I think the best example of this is for those of you that have seen The Invisible Gorilla. So this is um, Daniel Simmons and Christopher Chabry, who are um, social psychologists at, at, I think they were at, it was at Harvard at the time. And so basically what this is, it's a video. You can Google this. There's a book. There's a bunch of videos. A video of six people. Three are dressed in black. Three are dressed in white. And the three people dressed in black are passing a ball to each other. The three people dressed in white are passing a ball to each other. They're all mixed up together. Okay? And this is outside of a set of elevators, strangely, but that's what it was. And then you're supposed to count how many times the individuals wearing black, or sorry, wearing white, pass the ball to each other. So I've done this with PhD students at Harvard for many years now. First thing I notice is they're not very good at counting. Only about half actually count correctly. The other thing that happens is during this, a gorilla, an individual in a gorilla costume, walks across, and the gorilla pounds his chest in the middle of the, of the uh, screen and then walks back. Only about half of the individuals actually believe that they saw the gorilla, okay? So they've done follow-up studies, right? And so the question is, well, maybe you're focusing on something else, the corner of the screen or something, you really literally didn't see it. Using eye-tracking technology, everyone sees the gorilla for about one second, but you, they don't process uh, what they see. So even something as simple as processing all of the image around us, right, is very taxing, and we don't do this, we don't do this perfectly, okay? And so that's one example. So there are cognitive limits. 
So in the face of these limits, every day we have to make thousands and thousands of decisions. Think about just the average conversation with an individual. Uh, and you have to think about what to say, how to respond, how to respond to social cues. So we've developed heuristics or shortcuts that help us make decisions. Okay? So these might be less precise. If we sat down and really thought and did a constrained optimization problem, maybe we'd do better, but that takes time and energy. And so they're going to be less precise, these rules of thumb, these heuristics, but uh, they're going to save on cognitive costs. They're going to be really quick and really easy. Okay? And they can manifest themselves as deeply held religious views. So thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, or just gut feelings about the right thing and the wrong thing to do in a certain situation. Okay? And I think you can think of just the gut feelings. You show up to a party, and it turns out it's formal, you're dressed informally. You have this gut feeling that you're doing something wrong, and you really can't avoid that, right? And so that's, I think that's part of culture. That's part of what I think of culture, is these decision-making shortcuts. Okay, so that's all words. And you say, okay, that's a bit more precise, but it's still all a bit fluffy. Uh, so let me give you a, a precise model that actually shows this more concretely, okay? So think of a society that consists of a large population of individuals, a continuum one of individuals. Each generation, uh, or each period, a new generation is born, and then the old generation dies, okay? So it's basically an overlapping generations model. The new generation, so each period, the new generation is going to choose a once and for all decision, which is basically your action or your culture. You can think of it that way. And so I should say, this is the simplest possible model that one can develop to sh illustrate this. It's not the best model or the most sophisticated model, but I think it's the simplest. Okay, so you'll see how, how this is overly simple. So there are two unobservable states of the world. So we'll call those states zero and one. There's also two actions, zero and one. And basically, in what is the best action depends on what the state is. So here's the payoff matrix. If the environment is zero, the best action is zero. If the environment is one, the best action is one. So you get pi plus v, b versus pi minus b, okay? Uh, and so the other thing is we have some instability. Every period with some probability delta, there's a shock to the world, okay? And so when there's a shock to the world, there's a new draw on the state, okay? And just to make it, again, as simple as possible, it's a 50% chance you're in state zero and a 50% chance you're in state one every time there's a new draw, okay? So there's, and nothing's really observed. You can't observe the environment, you can't observe the shocks. So there's two types of players. So the first player we're all familiar with, these are economists or homo economicus, right? So you ignore tradition, you don't um, worry about what people tell you you should do. Instead, you sit down, maybe you gather some data, you run some RCTs, you put these through Stata, and you learn what's the optimal action in, in our setting, okay? And you're gonna learn this with certainty. So you know you're gonna determine what the state is with certainty, and then you know what's the optimal action and you're gonna choose it, okay? So the only thing is this involves a cost, a cost C. So this cost is epsilon, it could be the five minutes it takes you to run this RCT or the two years, but it's something that's greater than zero. So the other type we have are traditionalists, okay? So these people value tradition, okay? And so this is basically, they, they're choosing their action using culture. They're somebody from the, the previous generation, a randomly, randomly chosen person, but you can think of this as their parents, or uh, tell them, this is what you should do, okay? And they basically just choose that action, okay? They copy the action of somebody from the previous generation. So what's the benefit of this? Zero cost, okay? You just do what you're told to do, okay? And this is culture, right? This is something that's persistent, that's malleable over time, that affects our decisions, okay? So you can imagine somebody um, going to church as a child and then them developing these internal values and beliefs and that affecting their decisions, okay? And so P is gonna denote the proportion. I'm gonna call these traditionalists. You can call these culturalists, but these are people that believe in their culture or their culture is passed down over time and so they adhere to their tradition, okay? So non-traditionalists ignore tradition, engage in trial and error, bear the cost, so what's their payoff? It's pi plus b minus c, so super, super simple, okay? So these individuals, these homo economicus, get this payoff every period. Traditionalists, while well, they copy the action of somebody from the previous generation, you could think of this as the parents, randomly chosen person, and now we need to calculate their payoffs. So let's just think about what are all the ways that, or not all the ways, sorry, what are some ways that a traditionalist can obtain the right action, okay? So one way is if a traditionalist copied somebody from the pre previous generation who was a non-traditionalist, an economist, 
So they had figured out what the optimal action was in their setting, right? And, with, and uh, there was no shock, or the environment hasn't changed. And so that happens with probability one minus delta, okay? So with probability one minus P, you'll copy a non-traditionalist, right? And the environment will, there will not have been a shock from one period to another. That'll happen with probability one minus delta. If that happens, then I, as a traditionalist, am going to obtain the right action with certainty, okay? Oops. Okay, so that's one way. So what's another way? Well, what if me, so this is, I should explain this. This is me in the hat. Uh, here I copy somebody from the previous generation. This is somebody who's knowledgeable, an economist, and that's why they're in green. They look very happy. Okay. And, but another way is, if I, as, an, as me, this period, I copy someone from the previous generation, but the person from the previous generation was a traditionalist. Where did they get their action? Well, they copied somebody from the previous generation. But the person they copied was a non-traditionalist, somebody who had gone out, uh, figured out what's optimal, and they're doing what's optimal, okay? So in this case, I'll adopt what's optimal if there's no shocks over two periods. That happens with probability one minus delta squared. And with probability uh, one minus p, right, with probability one minus p, I, um, if probability one minus p, I copy a, sorry, pro probability p, I copy a traditionalist, probability one minus p, I copied a non-traditionalist. So you can keep doing this. Another way to obtain the optimal action is if I copy a traditionalist who copies a traditionalist who copies a non-traditionalist, right? And so this happens with probability p, probability p, and probability one minus p, and the environment hasn't changed over three periods, okay? We can keep going. Turns out we can keep going until infinity, right? And those are all ways in which I, as an individual, can obtain the right action, okay? And so the sum probability of all these events is gonna be this geometric sequence, right? So you can see there's a clear pattern here that's developing, okay? And so those are ways in which I, as an individual that just copies someone from the previous generation or culture is transmitted, can obtain the right action, okay? So with one minus this probability, right, basically what's happening is the environment is changing. Or, and the environment could change many, many, many times, right? And so one thing that makes the math very easy here is we've assumed that every time the environment changes is a new draw. There's a 50% chance that you're in one state or the other. So just by luck, sometimes you'll still be right with one minus this whole probability, and you'll still get pi plus b, and a 50% chance you'll still get pi minus b, okay? And so with this probability here, you'll get pi plus b. With one minus this probability, you'll get pi, okay? And then so we just do a bunch of, al a, a bunch of simple, very simple algebra. With this probability here, you get pi plus b. One minus that, you get pi. So this is very simple algebra reduces to this. You use the fact that the formula for a geometric sequence, and then basically that's the payoff to people who rely on tradition. They just do what their parents tell them to, irrespective of, of you know, what might seem optimal. And so these are the payoffs of the two types, okay? And so basically we can think about, well, which types would arise in equilibrium, which types would not arise. And to do this, you just draw the payoff functions of the two types. And payoffs can be a function of P, the proportion of traditionalists in the economy, okay? So when you think about, well, what, what's gonna be a Nash equilibrium here or a stable equilibrium? So one equilibrium, and I think this is an equilibrium we as economists should all care about is, well, there's only economists, there's only rational people in the, in the population. There's no, none of these people that l listen to their parents and are taught some religion and then just follow that blindly, okay? And so we can see, is that an equilibrium? So this would be basically your payoff here, okay, where there's, no traditionalist, everyone is a rational economist. And you, basically what you find is under fairly general circumstances, the payoff to traditionalists or these culturalists is higher than the payoff to the economists, okay? And you can see basically this is gonna be the case for sure uh, if delta was zero, if there's complete stability in the environment, right? Then that's always gonna be the case because C is greater than zero, okay? So what's going on here? Well, basically these, um, culturalists are free riding on all the information that others have collected, right? So they're basically saying, I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel, why do I need to do that? What, you know, my parents' generation, they figured it out, and the environment's not changing very much, so I'm just gonna do what, uh, what they did, right? And that's, and you, these guys don't have to bear the cost of C, okay? And so basically, this line is flat, 
right? And that's because these guys get the same payoff no matter how many other traditionalists or economists are in the population. These guys, their payoff is downward sloping because the more traditionalists there are in the population, the less knowledgeable people there are, right? So when they copy, they're less likely to get the right information. And down here, where everyone's a traditionalist, they're just copying each other. There's no real information. And basically, half the time they get it right, half the time they get it wrong just by luck. Okay, so that's the intuition. There's some continuity. So it turns out there's an equilibrium, in general, an interior equilibrium that looks like this, right? Where this proportion of the population, they basically use culture to make decisions. Okay? And this proportion, and the other proportion of the population, well, they go out, gather information, do a constrained maximization problem, uh, and that's how they make decisions. Okay? So I think this is important. It tells you why culture would arise, right? Uh, and under what conditions it would arise. So it's pretty general conditions. So it, this tells me, so I remember reading this in grad school, this tells me that this is something actually pretty serious that I think we should take relatively seriously, right? So it's a more efficient way in some situations to make decisions, okay? Okay, so let me give you one example. So let's go back to pictures. So that was the math. His, this is the real world example, and I think some of you have probably heard me talk about this. This is my favorite example. This is how maize is traditionally um, pro cooked in uh, Latin America, right? Um, and so what you do is, is dried maize, then you're gonna boil it in water for about 40 minutes, okay? Then you strain the water, you dump it out, that's fine, then you uh, mash it up into tortillas or masa, for example. So that's, that's, that sounds all completely reasonable. But what you do actually before, uh, in, what you put in the water is a bunch of ash from the fire, historically, okay? or lime, so basically dirt, uh, in the fire as well. Um, and I remember giving this talk at UBC, uh, and there was one person from Latin America in the audience. This person said, well, of course, how else would you cook uh, maize? This is, you know. And so I, talking to other people from Latin America, they say, well, it tastes much better when you do this, if you put dirt and ash in the, in, in the water. So that could be, it's not obvious. Uh, and I was talking to another guy for who's uh, actually, Timon knows him, Aldo, He's, yeah. He said, well, it gives you vitamin C. So, which I don't think that's, the dirt has, is high in vitamin C. Um, so, but it turns out there's a logic. So if you ask people, they don't know why they're doing this, right? So uh, your average fem female that's cooking for the family, they'll say, well, that's how my grandmother, that's how my mother taught me. This is just how we do it. And they'll say these things. They haven't really thought of it, but if they, you press them, they'll say these things, like, oh, it tastes better. Or, um, so, but it turns out there's an important reason. So uh, corn maize is deficient in niacin. So if you don't, if you eat a lot of maize as, as a proportion of the calories in your diet, 80, 90%, you'll develop a disease called pellagra. So this is, you'll basically develop these rashes, uh, you'll develop dementia, and eventually you'll die. Um, and so this is not a good disease uh, if you're eating a lot of um, uh, calories from corn. And, but it turns out this is a form of processing called alkali processing, right? And so these, the dirt and the ash is high in alkali. And basically what this does, it allows the existing, the small amounts of niacin that are in corn to be absorbed more efficiently uh, by your body. So there's actually a 1974 science article where they documented across um, Aboriginal groups within the Americas that those groups that had a high caloric in, uh, content and so were susceptible to pellagra basically uh, were the ones that cooked maize this way. Those that did not were not, were what did, cooked it uh, a different way, right? Or didn't have the alkali processing. So nobody knew this, right? In the model, remember, we allow people to figure this out within their lifetime, right? And so that's actually giving kind of a boost for the homo economicus or the economist. In reality, I don't think anybody in the Americas could have figured this out in their lifetime. So in some sense, culture allows us to figure things out through an evolutionary process that we otherwise really, really couldn't. So I think the statement's even stronger uh, than, than what the model makes. So the, the other interesting thing about this is uh, maize is indigenous to the Americas. Christopher Columbus discovers the Americas, brings maize back to, to, to the old world, to Europe, to Africa. B so the food went with them, but the culture did not. So then in northern Italy, people didn't cook, uh, didn't cook maize this way, and so they all developed pellagra. Same with the U.S. South and also in Lesotho today. And so this is, I think, kind of highlights the importance of culture and the value of culture. Okay, so how big are the cultural differences that we observe in the world today? Actually, I'm just gonna grab water. And so again, so, you know, 
I don't have a huge amount of time, but hopefully with those few examples, I've at least got you thinking that maybe there is something to this culture thing, okay? It's not some vacuous word that we really don't understand what it means that people throw around. And so a good question is how big are cultural differences in the world today? So even if we understand conceptually what culture is, measuring it is very, very, very difficult, okay? So if you see one person acting more violently than another person, you could say, well, that's their culture. That person has a violent culture, right? But it might be that person is in a very different setting, right? So uh, if one country is engaged in civil war and another country isn't, you could say, well, that's a very violent country, cu culture, but there could be a lot of other differences. And then it becomes kind of tautological. I think that's what some people dislike about this line of thinking. So there's been a lot of work that's basically really trying to think hard about how do we, how do we measure culture. And so basically what you need to do is you need to hold everything else constant, right? If you're looking at a person's actions, you basically need to hold everything else constant. And if they systematically choose different actions, that tells you it's something about their preferences or their culture. So in other words, if it's a behavioral game and then the actions and the payoffs are exactly the same and you find people choosing systematically different actions, that's pretty strong evidence uh, that it's something that's within them that's causing them to choose these different actions. So you can bring the lab to people the other way, which has been done with immigrants coming to the US and to Canada, is basically look at people from different cultural backgrounds, but now they've come to the same setting and they're facing the same external environment, right? Uh, so if you see female labor force participation rates are different for this people living in the same city that were all born and raised within the US, but they have parents from different cultural backgrounds, then that's some evidence of that, okay? So that's kind of the two ways. So I won't go into too much detail about that, but there is this large literature uh, and there's many, many more papers than this that documents these, these differences. Um, and so, but I think one important thing to, to note, and Joe Henrik's been talking about this for years, uh, who's, who, who um, was recently at UBC and now is at Harvard, is when, when we measure these cultural differences, the West, us, we're outliers, we're not the norm, right? So I think this is really important for economic development, okay? So let me just give you an example of this. So which line is longer, okay? So you can think about your, in, in your own mind, is it the top line or the bottom line, okay? And so in this case, which you probably have guessed, they're the same, okay? But what you can do is you can have different experiments where you vary these and then you ask people which is longer, which is less long, and they're not really sure, and then they choose. And in the Western societies, we think that the bottom one is longer, okay? So it might appear to you that the bottom one is longer. So this is called the Mueller liar illusion, okay? And if you look across societies, basically, this is Evanston, and this is uh, South Africa Europeans. The illusion, this is basically the proportion, uh, how, in percentage terms, how wrong do you get it? So basically you can give them different lengths and see how far off they are with the lengths that they choose that are equal. And other ethnic groups, right, around the world don't seem to suffer near as bad. To this, from this illusion, okay? So another game that's been played around the world, again, this is, uh, so this is due primarily to Joe Henrik, who's the first person to play this game outside of uh, Western European society, uh, is the ultimatum game. So just to review, I'm sure everyone knows this, ultimatum game is we're gonna split $10. There's player one's gonna offer to player two a split. Player two can say yes or no. If player two says no, then they both get zero, if player two says yes, then they get the split that was proposed, okay? And so this down here is basically the offer in the ultimatum game. In the US, what you find is 50-50 is the modal offer. So that's the most common. But you see actually in other societies around the world, it turns out 50-50 isn't always the modal offer. And these other societies actually are behaving closer to the Natch equilibrium, which is basically to offer us one penny or zero and the other person to accept, okay? So again, we, Right, this isn't, I know we're not American, but we as North Americans uh, are here. I'm sure Canada would be exact, very, very similar. So similarly, a dictator game, you're given $10 and you're asked, how much do you want to give to the other person? Uh, again, we're outliers here, okay? So I, so I think this is very important. So there are cultural differences, and I think interestingly, interestingly, we as the rich industrialized world, we're kind of the extreme, okay? So, the third question is, well, what are the determinants of these, of, of these cultural differences, okay? So this is the Mueller-Liar illusion again. So which line is longer, okay? And remember, this is actually the same characteristics of those other lines. 
they're both exactly the same length, okay? So if you take this, so you can, I'll, I'll post these slides, you can take it and just basically draw a line across, again, they're the same length. So this has to do with how we visually process information, right? So this is a visual heuristic. I don't know if it's similar or not to a cultural heuristic. Uh, there might be some analogies, but it's because of how we visually process information. So if a person walks away from you, they get smaller and smaller, but you don't assume that they're physically getting smaller and smaller. You understand that we're in a 3D world, okay? And that's basically, that's one hypothesis of the reason behind these illusions, right? We view this as a corner that's closer to us than that. So it turns out, what lines up very well with that variation we saw, saw is, do you live in a carpentered world? So in other words, do you live in a world that has buildings with corners? I'm sure you've all seen huts in many, uh, you know, many parts of Africa that actually tend to be cylindrical or round, okay? So it's not completely obvious that everybody is gonna uh, live in a world like this, okay? So this is just one example. So another example, back to the ultimatum game. This is from um, the 2005 paper by Joe Henrik and co-authors. Here, he, he finds this correlation between market integration. There's a whole host of causality issues, so we won't kind of uh, talk about that. What I want to focus on is, well, what's the, the variation? And actually, the one outlier. So remember I said, oh, Western Europeans, they're the outliers, they're the extreme. This is Western Europeans, this is UCLA, the university. Uh, and then there's one that's even more giving or offers more to the other player, right? So this is about 50-50, the lamellera they offer actually for the other player to have more than 50% of the pie. They offer on average for them to have about 57% of the pie. So what's going on here? So if you look at the Lamellera, th so this is a small village off the coast of Indonesia. This is how they subsist. So um, historically and even today, basically the Lamellera are whale hunters and they have these non-motorized boats and um, and they have individuals that are jumping off of these boats with bamboo spears and then spearing the whales, okay? And here's basically after the whale's been killed and then they divide up uh, the catch uh, cr between everyone in the village, okay? So this is very cooperative. If you were a super selfish guy and just said, I'm doing this on my own, I'm not sharing with anyone, I'm not helping anyone, uh, you're not gonna live very long if this is the only way you have to subsist, okay? And so, you know, both of these, I think, tell us, well, our environment or the setting in which we evolve has some effect on these heuristics that develop, right? So this makes sense. If you're in an environment like this, a heuristic that says, oh, I'm gonna help out others, they're gonna help out me, uh, that's pretty good, uh, is gonna do a lot better than in other environments, maybe Western Europe, where, uh, where you don't have the same type of cooperation that's necessary, okay? So there's a whole, whole literature, and so some of you maybe thought that this is kind of what I was gonna talk about mostly in this talk, because that's kind of the work I've done in the past. So it's basically, you know, what are the long-run impacts of different shocks, and how do they affect cultural traits, institutional traits? Um, so there's, there's that, let me actually just go to that. So, you know, so there's that, um, Krishna talked about some of this. Um, and then there's also really interesting work that's done on the short-run impacts. Okay, so there's these long run impacts that have effects over generations and generations and they persist and we can see them. So for example, the slave trade affecting trust. Um, it, Arthur Bluin at, at Toronto has a really fantastic line of research, basically where forced labor, where Tutsis basically whipped Hutus. Uh, you can see this today when you play trust games between Hutus and Tutsis. Uh, so there's a whole, host of, a, a whole host of research. I think the short run determinants are super interesting as well. Uh, there's a great paper, my favorite paper out, out of all of these is this pa paper by Madastam and David Yanagazawa Drott. And they're basically asking, well, what are the impacts of socialization activities? Okay, in particular, the 4th of July is what they pick. So everyone gets together, you have barbecues, you sing, you wave the flag. You know, does this cause you just to become a little bit more American? So that's an interesting question. If you looked at the data, you would see, well, people that go to these things, they're more American. But then, of course, we all know there's reverse causality, there's other issues. So what do they do? Well, they actually look and see, when you were growing up on the 4th of July, did it rain, basically? And in which years did it rain? So if it rains, all of these activities are outdoors, right? Barbecues, parades, fireworks. And if it rained, you're probabilistically gonna be more likely to just have stayed home, okay? And you can look at what period, so large data set all across the US, in what periods of time uh, historically, uh, in your youth, did it rain and did it not rain, and what years of life then seem to matter, okay? And so they find participating in the 4th of July does seem to matter. 
It causes you to vote more, okay, more patriotic, and also causes you to become more Republican and less Democratic. So, so the Democrats really hated this paper. <laughs> they said, you know, Fourth of July is our holiday too. This is not like Republicans' only holiday. Um, and so they, re they, they really hated this paper. Um, the Republicans hated it. I don't know, I think just because he was at Harvard, and this is a left-wing left -wing liberal university, and they just hate everything that came out of that. And so he was actually on holidays uh, when this paper was advertised by the Kennedy School and had to come back because he was getting so much hate mail and so much negative press. Uh, so I think, it's, yeah, I think it's a fantastic paper, and that kind of really, really provides some, you know, some evidence that the way we're socialized when we're young has these, ha have these impacts and we might not even realize them. Similarly, do you grow up in recessions? That has impacts on risk aversion. There's a whole host I could go through these. But. So I think the, the, the evidence is accumulating. There, there are these long-run determinants as well. Um, and I just want to go through one paper, just a very, very quick paper, um, which is my own, only because I know it, it's easier than going through someone else's paper. But I think there's lots of other great papers that are like this. And so what people have started to do, this is an interface between economic history and behavioral economics, is basically, knowing the historical record around the world, thinking about are there particularly interesting populations or settings f for which we could bring behavioral experiments, right? So you might have noticed all these behavioral experiments and behavioral economics, experimental economics are basically undergrad classes in Western universities, okay? Uh, but we saw there's a lot of variation. And so maybe if we actually bring these experiments to interesting settings, we can learn a lot, okay? And hist historically informed settings is the way I would think of this, okay? And so with James Robinson, Sarah Lowe as a student, Jonathan Weigel, we were particularly interested in the question, do good states make good citizens, okay? So it's one of the reasons that we all behave so well in Canada is because we have such a well-functioning state. The state has these great rules that enforce good behavior, and then that good behavior causes us to uh, believe that's normal, and then we feel bad if we deviate from this. So it could be that good states make good citizens. And so there's a setting within Africa. This is an individual named King Mbop, who is from the Cuba Kingdom, okay? And so this kingdom has a particular history. I'll go through this in one second. Uh, and this is a very well-known kingdom, actually, even though probably most people haven't heard of this. This is actually from the cover of Life magazine. Uh, and they're particularly well-known for being very European. Okay? In other words, having a very well-functioning state, a division of power, they actually had a judicial system that had a court of appeals and a Supreme Court. Uh, so it was very, very advanced, particularly for Africa. And so much so that when Europeans showed up, they came across this kingdom and they said, oh, well, we must have been here before. There must have been people that visited them beforehand and showed them what civilization looked like. And so the first thing we did is 2013, we went up to the Cuba Kingdom which took about five days in total of travel. It's based, I don't have a map, it's basically right in the center of Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is the prince, uh, the regent, and then a right-hand man. So that's the prince, the regent, and the right-hand man. And the king was cu is currently sick, so he wasn't available for the, for the ceremony. And so they still exist. Oops, let's see here. There it is. Um, and what's unique about the setting and why we spent, it's probably like one of the hardest places to get to in the world, why we kind of spent all this effort was because of the unique history. So the history is basically around the 1400s, there's this, what Jan van Sina calls the Nkumu expansion. So expansion of Mongo-speaking peoples down to this area, and they drove out the local pygmies, okay? So this is around 1400, 1500. And so there's a new group that's here. They freshly migrated. So the nice thing here is at time zero, culture is homogenous, right? Or there's no systematic differences, okay? So we're thinking about what's the impact of states on culture. Then the nice thing is we don't have to worry as much about reverse causality, okay? So they're all living in independent villages. And then this one guy named King Shyam comes along. He basically was connected to the Atlantic trade, which is over here. And he brought with him cassava, maize, different crops, uh, different technologies. And basically, it's very unclear how, but he was able to, and possibly because of these technologies, convince these villages to form into a large kingdom and he, he become the king, okay? And then these, the kingdom expanded naturally and then it just stopped at these rivers, okay, here. And so basically this group here, they are also descendants from the same, uh, from the same people. They call themselves the children of Wut. 
but they weren't part of the Kuba kingdom. They were just living in autonomous ind independent villages. Uh, here, basically, they're part of this Kuba kingdom, super strong institutions. The kingdom had much better rule of law, much less conflict, uh, and became much, much more prosperous. Okay? And so we were interested, basically, in what impact does the kingdom have on the psychology of these individuals? In particular, are they willing to follow the rules, even if they know that they can get away with it and that the rules uh, don't affect them? Okay? So how does it affect rule following? Does it make good civic-minded citizens? So we went there, went to these villages, or to, to individuals that were descended from these villages, so we actually went to this area here, and we ran ex behavioral experiments. Okay? And basically wanted to know to what extent did people cheat? in these behavioral experiments in particular settings where, there was where they could get away with it. So I won't go through the details, but I'll tell you one experiment, which we kind of stumbled across by accident. We played the ultimatum game with them, so, right? So you just heard about the ultimatum game, but it was too hot for computers, right? So we had to play it old fashioned style with a stack of bills, okay? So they're sitting in the tent with a stack of bills and we say, well, you need to make the division between you and the other player, your player one. And the way you do that is you divide these bills into two piles and put the bills in one envelope versus the other envelope. And then we'll take those sealed envelopes, bring them back to the office, and we'll know that's your offer, right? And then we'll match that up into player two's decisions and then come back next week, okay? So that sounds great. So we're just doing it with actually literally physically dividing the pie. But what, what happens is, well, they're sitting in this tent, they have all this money in front of them, this is like two or three days wages, they realize, well, instead of dividing the pie and giving these envelopes back to you, why don't I just put the pie in my pocket, right? And so that's literally what they did, did is they put the money, some of the money in their pocket, most of them. Uh, so one person repeatedly just returned two empty em envelopes and put all the money in their pocket. So this is one measure of cheating, right? So there's other probabilistic measures, but I think this is kind of an interesting measure. And so what do we find? The interesting thing, big surprise to us actually, is there was much, much more cheating within the Cuba territory, right? All the other territories looked very similar, including these people are culturally different or didn't descend from Wut, come from down here, but this, this group did, and even with these two, this kind of cultural RD, you see that the Cuba cheat more, okay? And so this is actually consistent with another story, another intuition, is motivational crowding, right? When the state enforces good behavior, a culture is not necessary that induces the good behavior through intrinsic motivations, right? So it doesn't really matter whether people are intrinsically motivated to behave well, to follow the rules here, because the state's doing it top down. In these independent villages, there's no state, and if basically the villages don't have people that are intrinsically motivated to behave well, uh, then they're not gonna last very long, okay? And so there's actually some formal models recently that kind of, uh, 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 dictate this, right? So basically, if the state's gonna enforce, ensure that your kid's gonna behave, parents are, have less incentive to make sure, teach their kids to behave, right? Okay, and, and so I, why I mention this, I think there's, so um, there's a bunch of people, Felipe Valencia Caseda, Arthur Bluen is another individual, who have really, and they, they both have strong historical backgrounds, really think hard before they um, start an experiment about where's the best place to design this experiment. Okay. And then they go to this location, even though it's a big pain in the butt, and uh, go to these individuals and then uh, measure these behavioral characteristics there. Okay. okay. So it's a bit, of, a bit of a puzzle to some extent is, well, we have evidence that culture persists over very long periods of time. Okay. And we, but we also have evidence that these more short-run factors, like did it rain on the 4th of July, also has impacts. So how is it that we can have some of these regressions over hundreds of years, but then these other things that say within a person's lifetime there's shocks and then, uh, and then things change, okay? So another way to think of this was, well, what determines when culture persists and when it changes? Okay, so we have evidence of, of both, okay? So I think, to me, this is an interesting line of future research, and so let me just show you, though, something very, very, very simple. This is the same model, okay? And, but we have a comparative static, which I didn't mention, delta. Okay, so this is how frequently are you hit by these shocks so that probabilistically you might change states, okay? And remember, when delta, the way to think of this is when delta is zero, there's perfect stability, culture does really, really, really well. Imagine delta is one, so there's a new shock every period, then culture doesn't do so well, right? There's a cultural trait that's evolved up into your parents' generation 
and then, but it's not really suitable for your generation because you're going to be hit by a shock. Okay? So basically in the model, what this predicts is um, the more unstable the environment is, the less beneficial uh, culture is. In other words, also the less beneficial, this view that holding on to tr tradition is really, really important. Okay? And so two, re two reasons this is interesting. One is to understand cultural change and persistence. When does it change? When does it persist? The other reason is it's, this is actually a testable prediction of this model. So if we think this is all complete BS, then this prediction shouldn't hold, right? And so we can actually take this to the, mod to, to the data. And so we do this in a paper with Paolo Giuliano. Basically, so the prediction is when the environment is more variable, unstable over time, so basically when my ancestor's environment was more variable, tradition is going to be valued less, and there's going to be less cultural persistence. Okay, so really stable environments, that's when people are going to really hold on to tradition, and then there's going to be a lot of persistence of tradition. So what do we do? So we're not very creative. So we just like take this literally. The model says variability of the environment. So we say, okay, how do we measure the environment? We have temperature. Uh, let's look at variability of temperature across generations. So remember, delta is the shocks across generations between 500 and 1900. So this is where we can get data. And so this is at the grid cell level, the data. And this is what the variability, so from one generation to another, how much does temperature change? Okay, and so there's actually a lot of evidence now about, for example, the Little Ice Age having huge impacts on height, on warfare, on incomes, witch killings, et cetera. And so it's plausible that the environment, particularly in these agricultural societies, would have affected what's, what are the optimal actions. Okay. And then so you can just do simple things like line up uh, how related is this to people's self-reported importance of tradition? Is it the case where the environment is more stable, right? So basically where it's, where it's yellow, uh, that in those environments, people are going to report stronger importance of tradition, okay? And the other thing you can do is look at the persistence of traits over time. So we look from the pre-industrial era into today, and there's things like female labor force participation rates. Those have been going up. Polygamy has been going down, cousin marriage has been going down, right? But what we find is basically there's less persistence over time amongst societies that lived in a more unstable environment, okay? So exactly as the model predicted. And then the other thing is, is we look at natural experiments. So look at immigrants that come to the U.S. You come to the U.S., the tradition back home was you marry someone from within your own country. Now you're in the U.S., there's lots of other options. Do you still marry someone from your own country? That's you holding on to tra tradition. Another thing is the tradition was for you to speak the language of your country. Now you're in the US, people speak English, right? So it's a pain in the butt to speak the language of your country. Do you still continue to do that, okay? And again, we find variability is associated with abandoning your tradition. So immigrants are a select group, but there's another group which is in a very similar situation in North and South America, and these are indigenous populations, okay? Uh, and so basically we look at do indigenous populations, First Nations populations, still speak their indigenous language? And again, you find something very, very similar. The more variable the environment, the less likely they are to uh, speak their indigenous language. So they're more likely to adopt, uh, to abandon tradition. Okay, so we first did this in the, in the US, and then thanks to a comment from Krishna, we should have done, he, so Krishna saw pa Paola present this, He's, and then he said, oh, the only, the only remotely convincing part of the paper is the, uh, is the indigenous uh, populations part. Uh, and so he said, well, what we should do is uh, replicate this for Canada. So thanks to Donna Fair, she pointed us in the right direction in terms of data. Uh, and uh, it turns out we get the exact same thing, the exact same thing with Canada. And so, um, so it seems to, everything seems to line up. So let me just show you a little bit, just so you don't take my word for it, that, that things line up and the model seems to verify. This is world value survey question. This is individuals are asked, tradition is important to this person, to follow family customs handed down by one's religion or family. And people are asked, is this person like you? In other words, do you agree with this statement? And you can create a variable that's one to six. There's a whole host of work that's linking individuals in their countries to where their ancestors lived. I'll skip that. But you do that and you basically correlate how stable were, was a population's environment of their ancestors, and then the importance of tradition to them, okay? So the more unstable the environment, 
right? The less, cult less well culture is going to do, the less people believe it's important to follow tradition. Okay? So in these unstable settings, they say, well, you know, the previous generation did it that way, but you know, that doesn't really matter. It's fine. In these more stable settings, they say, no, no, this is the way we've always done it. Right? There's no way you're changing. This is parents talking to children. Uh, and so that's kind of the variation that, uh, th th that I think we're capturing there. This is just raw data from the US. This is instability of the origin country. These are um, women within the US. Their parents were born abroad, but they were born and raised in the US. And this is basically, is the husband from the same country of origin as the woman? And then this is aggregated to the country level. Okay, so you can see basically, again, the more unstable the environment, the more willing women are to marry outside of their ancestry. Okay? And this is basically tells you the kind of size of each of these countries. Okay? So this is Mexico up here. And you see, just even in the raw data, these, these relationships are quite strong. Uh, you see this strong negative relationship. This is speaking a foreign language at home. So same, exact same thing, proportion of people that speak a foreign language at home. If you're historically from an unstable environment, you value tradition less, you're more likely to adopt or abandon your traditional language, right? So it's, it, you'd think it's not really that important that we ca carry on the traditions uh, of our ancestors, okay? And again. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna, t or no, so second to last thing I'm gonna talk about is, well, that's fine. So even if you believe everything up until now, I've probably, maybe I have 5% of people that still believe, uh, and then others have been lost along the way. Uh, so the f for the 5%, you can really believe that there is something to culture. There are these different empirical studies that line all of this up. But, you know, really, does culture matter for anything we care about at all? Okay? It might not. For, you know, we're economists after all. We're not anthropologists. We're not psychologists. So does, this care, d does culture affect anything that we as economists care about? So here's, here's one example. And so this is actually is written up in an AER Papers and Proceedings that just came out. Uh, so it's just a short little story. And it basically the background is, so March 2015, I was in Goma with a uh, young faculty member from Berkeley named Raul Sanchez de la Sierra. Uh, and we're, we visited this village here. Um, and so the village, so this is near Goma, eastern part of DRC. This is a very, very uh, war-torn war -torn area. So since the Rwandan genocide of 1994, Hutus were doing a lot of killings. Then uh, Tutus re uh, Tutsis regain power. Then the Hutus leave, and they leave to the eastern DRC. And then basically from then on, they're kind of, you know, they're killing, raping, pillaging. And these other rebel groups arise to defend themselves against these guys. Um, and, then, and then they also rape, kill, and pillage. And so right now, there's probably about 30 rebel groups roaming around this area. So if you're individuals that live in this village, and uh, so we met a lot of these individuals, your village would be raided about 12 times a year, okay? So it'd be raided, there'd be a place in the jungle where you would all go, where you would all meet, and then you would stay there for a day or two, then you would come back, and you'd find all your pots and pans and your beds and everything would be gone, but that's basically the best case scenario for you. So this was the case of this village for about 12 years, and, but strangely, by when we got there in 2005, the village had basically freed itself from these rebel groups, right? for a period of two years, okay? So how was it that this happened? Two years prior to that, so 2013, there was an old man, he was a, he, and we, we talked to him, and so this is from him, uh, who basically woke up and he had a dream about how he could bulletproof the men in the village, okay? So we we're being tormented by these rebel groups, and aha, I have a dream, I've, bullet, I've learned how to bulletproof the men in the village, and so he told the men, and they, he, they underwent this initiation ritual, or it's not initiation, a bulletproofing ritual. So it's done in the jungle, um, it's done this particular herbs, um, and then with this kind of added confidence, they were able to stand up to the Hutu militia. So they only had machetes, the militia had machine guns, but over time, they were able to kill enough, uh, kill enough um, Hutus uh, and gain machine guns, and then eventually they defended themselves, right? And so you say, well, this doesn't make any sense at all. How does this all work? So this is what we were asking. So first of all, you know, some people did die. How is it that they didn't realize bulletproofing didn't work? Well, there were conditions associated with it. Okay, so five conditions, like you can't drink rainwater, you can't eat cucumbers, 
So things that are hard to verify, if you're running through the jungle, the guy next to you gets shot, say, oh, he must have had a cucumber last night. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's part of it. We, we also asked him how was it that he was able to convince uh, these young men that, that you know, he was, t he was telling the truth or he, was, he, uh, he had known how to bulletproof them. So he said he bulletproofed a goat in the, t in the center of the square and shot it and it didn't die, and then they realized. Okay? So whether that's true or not, it's... So, so in, the, in the paper, we actually have a bit of a model that says, well, how is it that this can be in equilibrium, right? So, so why I tell you this here is you'd say, well, these, so this is a belief, right? This is exactly one of these actions that are transmitted from one generation to another, right? And people believe this. And I guess I should say bulletproofing isn't uh, unique to this village, and it's something that's very common, right? So they, they had heard of bulletproofing before, and it's common. They just didn't know how to do it, and then he had a dream about how to do it. So this belief in bulletproofing these su supernatural powers is common. There's a long tradition of it. Um, and so what we think is happening here is, well, basically defending your village is team production, right? And we kind of know that with team production in equilibrium, there's underinvestment. So what does bulletproofing do? It causes you to um, misperceive the cost of that investment, probably you're dying, and then you're going to invest more and get closer to what's optimal, right? And then in a, in a setting where there's a lot of fighting village to village intergroup competition, the villages that are, have the more optimal, closer to optimal levels of effort are the ones that are going to survive. Or, and that seems to be what happened here. Okay? So otherwise, the amount of investment in the public good to defend the village is going to be too low. Then you have this misperception. It's higher. And then it actually has beneficial outcomes. Okay? So the point here is I think that we care about this as economists. Th this is peace prosperity. Now they can engage in economic activities. Now they can invest in things and not have them stolen. Uh, and so I think this is something that we, 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 we care about. Okay. Uh, so let me give you more concrete examples. I think if you read about kind of development, long run development in Africa, uh, one thing that's been focused a lot on, which makes complete sense, is institutions. Okay. And there's a lot of work showing that, well, places that historically had more centralized states, they do better today. Okay? So if, if you read the anthropology literature, though, there's actually not much mention of centralization or state centralization. There's more mention of these two things, segmentary lineage structures and age sets. Okay? So these are actually not institutional. You could, it starts to get fuzzy what's institutional, what's not. These are really, um, I would call them cultural, beliefs about how we should organize things. Okay? And so let me show you, segmentary lineage is basically we're going to organize power. We're going to organize where people live, what rights they have, by lineage. Okay, uh, and basically, in these societies, lineage is super important. People know what lineage they're in, and they can trace their lineage back, you know, uh, 10, 20 generations. Okay, so uh, Jared Diamond has talked about this, and this is super important in Papua New Guinea. You're tramping through the forest, you come across a stranger, and you're not sure whether you're friends or enemies, right? And so what do you do? You both start trying to cite your lineage. And then if you find you have an ancestor in common, then you're friends, right? If you don't have ancestors in common, then you're kind of in trouble. Uh, and so this is you know, extremely, extremely important. You can see this arising from the kind of nuclear family and then just extending, extending, extending. Um, and the other thing about these societies th is they're unilineal. So either matrilineal or patrilineal. So in our society, we're not unilineal. We're kind of equally connected, more or less, to our mother's side and our father's side. But things start to get very complicated and messy, so these societies have to be unilineal. And so this is, would be a typical family tree. Uh, so this would be one individual here, and he would have uh, brothers, uh, this would be his father, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is a bit stylized, simplified. And so what happens, though, in these, in these settings, and this is very cultural, if my brother gets in a fight with somebody, I feel obligated to defend them. Okay? Uh, if my cousin gets in a fight with somebody, then I also feel obligated to defend them. So if this guy got in a fight uh, with this guy, basically these guys would fight these guys. Okay? But if this guy got in a fight with the guy over here, this whole lineage would fight that whole lineage. Okay? So some people call this tribalism, right? where f clans fight other clans, whereas kind of in our individualistic society, this guy would have a grievance with this, this guy and we would just let him duke it out. Okay? So it's a very a cultural thing, what you think is right, what you think is important to do. So in these societies, what you find is little conflicts escalate into large-scale conflicts. Right? 
And so you know, Evans Pritchard had ta talked about this. There's a, I think this is the best way to think of it, a Bedouin proverb. Uh, so this is a segmentary lineage uh, society. So it's, their, their proverb is, so this is kind of a motto to life, I against my brothers, so I fight with my brothers. My brothers and I against my cousins, though. So we'll fight, but then we'll cooperate to go against our cousins. And, but me, my cousins, my brothers, and I against the world. Okay, so there's a lot of fighting, but then you cooperate to fight against something else. And so basically what we did is, there's no data on this, but we coded this up. And for 145 societies, we were able to code this up. And if you just, basically, we know where societies live. We know where conflicts occur from this fine-grained ACLID data. And you can just see, is it true, and this is conditional on a whole host of stuff, is it true that segmentary lineage societies are more likely to fight? And this is small-scale conflicts. Uh, and you see this very, uh, you know, very strongly for all different types of conflicts. Okay, so that seems to be consistent with, the, with what the anthropologists have been writing for about 70 years. So you can do something even more fine-grained. So there's a lot of identification issues. You can look at the border of different ethnic groups and see, well, if it really is something about segmentary lineage, then basically conflict should change discontinuously right when these other traits, this other trait changes discontinuously, okay? And so this is basically ethnic identification, so we know these borders are real. And then this is basically the RD. So you kind of see this jump in conflict propensity of these localized conflicts when you move from a non-segmentary lineage to a segmentary lineage society, okay? So even zooming in at borders where you think other omitted factors are gonna be held constant more or less, you still see this, okay? So again, as economists, I think we care about conflict. I think this is first order, it's not unimportant. Uh, it affects investment, affects long-run development. And so here, it's really just, it's really is cultural. It's just the belief that when my 20th cousin gets in a, in a fight, goes to war, that I have to follow him. Right? And so just every, these large groups of men are being mobilized uh, just for these, what are initially small scale sk uh, skirmishes. Okay, so the very last one I'm gonna talk about is age sets. So with segmentary lineages, things are organized vertically along a lineage, we saw that, right? So, but that's not the only way to organize societies. The other way to organize society is an age set, okay? Uh, and an age set, you can think about, well, the people you graduated with uh, the people that were in your elementary school, that's basically an age set. You guys are all within the same age, age cohort, right? It's not so, so important because after, you know, you leave elementary school, you don't really uh, associate or feel allegiance to that group. But in many parts of Africa, these age sets are a big, big deal, okay? So this is Mbaka. So this is an area in Northern Democratic Republic of Congo where we work. And this is a traditional Mbaka initiation ceremony. So around the age of adolescence, um, Basically, young men go out into the jungle, and for about six months to a year, they undertake initiation ceremonies. This includes circumcision. Uh, there's a lot of, from focus groups, a lot of talk about whipping. People do die, uh, but they also learn uh, ancestry. You learn uh, how to build houses, how to farm, uh, witchcraft, etc. So it's this really extreme experience, and what happens is the young men, they form this very tight, cohesive uh, group. Right? And they belong to the same age set. And then over life, they pass through different age grades together. So at a certain point in time, it's like, okay, now you're allowed to marry. Now you're allowed to build a house. Now you're allowed to marry. A certain point of time, now you're allowed to hold political office and political power. And that's just the way society is organized. Okay? Um, and so this is actually, uh, more recently, the same ethnic group. Uh, and it's pretty amazing how similar this is uh, from the uh, colonial period how similar these two are. This is, this is kind of interesting, it looks like a soother, but it's actually a whistle that they're blowing during this ceremony. Okay, and so why might age sets matter? And again, this is just borrowing straight from anthropology. This is just reading what they're saying and then regurgitating it. So they build these very strong horizontal ties. So what you have in the village is a group of young men, very cohesive, so they've overcome this free rider problem. They act as a unit. And then what you find is basically Anytime someone has a grievance, they go to these young men, okay? And these young men, they basically form this balance of power uh, that balances the elite of the village. And these are just uh, images of elites in these villages. And what do you know? These are chiefs, basically. What do you notice? Well, they're all older in age, right? This is also because of the age set, right? So then you have these, a smaller number of older elites, right? They're the chiefs. And then you have these young men which protest against the chiefs and basically counterbalance the power of the chiefs. 
Okay, so this is basically what just what um, anthropologists have conjectured, what they've noticed from a few examples. And so we've undertaken surveys in this area, 200 villages, now up to 300, and we find exactly consistent with this, villages that have age sets, okay, and so there's causality issues, we can definitely talk about this, are more likely to believe, um, sorry, are less likely to believe that it's important to agree with elders, have less trust in their chief, but this is even the case despite the fact that when you have age sets, chiefs do better. They provide more public goods, chiefs are less likely to be hereditary, and so it seems like these age sets, by providing a check on the power of the elite, seem to elicit better outcomes, okay? And so this is share of men in a village, these are bin scatter plots that have participated in the age set initiation. You see less trust in chiefs, okay? But you see the, the chiefs are more likely to be elected, okay? So less likely to be hereditary. And then this is basically what public goods do they provide? They provide more public goods, okay? So again, this is age set, just this feeling of camaraderie and how important it is to be allied to people of your own age and how important it is to go through, have these initiation ceremonies to go through them. These are all cultural traits. So when you see here that they have big important impacts on ins the institutional structure and the economic prosperity of these societies. Okay. okay, so the last one is what are the implications, if any, for economic policy? So I guess I'm very forward looking. I knew I would run out of time. Um, and so it turns out tomorrow morning, there's this CDESG panel, 9 a.m., and where that's exactly the topic, right? So I'll be talking with Leonard Wanchikon and, uh, and, uh, and others about um, you know, things related to this. So I think it's an important question, which I've just barely, barely started to think about, which is um, basically given this, what does this mean for economic policy? So one could think, well, development is development. Some places are poor. Who really cares why they're poor? How much of this is because of institutions, culture? Uh, let's just implement RCTs. We're going to like RCT our way out of poverty. Okay. So to do an RCT, you just sit in, sit in Cambridge or in Vancouver or wherever and just send out your people, get the data back, scale up. Uh, and so what I'll talk about is I think there's actually uh, better ways to do development than that. Okay, so that's all I have. So any questions, I'd be happy to happy to.